All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, today's special guest on our Zoom cast uh, is Sonia Jones of Sonia Jones Travel. Uh, Sonia is a very experienced agent and uh, been in the game for, for quite some time and, and has obviously given up some of her time today to share her story and how things have been going out there on the front line with her and her business. Um, and obviously, you know, plenty of people out there probably know who you are, um, Sonia, but, you know, for those few that might not, um, how about you like to give us uh, your sort of backstory into the, into the game and into the industry and, and how Sonia Jones Travel came about? Awesome. Thanks, George. Thanks for having me on. Um, so I've been a travel advisor for 18 years and it was one of those things where my love of travel and passion kind of led me to, oh my God, I need a job. Um, we'd been, I finished uni, I did um, a degree in Japanese linguistics, went and lived in Japan for a year. Um, and then after that went traveling and backpacked through Europe and North America. And I was on the East coast of um, the US and a of uh, the west coast of the US and about to head home and had, you know, sort of about a week till I was getting back and going, oh, I need to get a job. Like, I need a job when I get back. What am I going to do? I've got this uni degree that, I don't know, Japanese linguistics, like, it's not very exciting. I love travel. And I started having a look and thought, oh, I'll try Flight Centre. So I applied while I was in Hawaii and did a phone interview, um, like, two days later then landed in Australia and then had my actual interview in at um, Adelaide Street in Brisbane and um, sold my pineapple. And as many people have done in those original interviews um, for Flight Center. And yes, yeah, started a week later and worked for five years in the red and white stores. And then I graduated and moved to Travel Associates and worked there and had seven awesome years um, with the Purple Grand. Um, and it really, I learned so much through that period. Um, you know, I, I'm very, you know, target and sales driven, but I also learnt from the red and white, but then moving into the into travel associates, I learnt so much about caring for the customer and, and digging deeper and really building these beautiful itineraries and thinking outside the box for what I could do for my clients. And so after 12 years in total, I um, decided that I wanted a more flexible life. I had two kids um, and I had a great client base and I you know, I was getting more passionate about me as a brand and rather than, a, you know, a big corporation being who I was. And so I decided to go out on my own and have been independent now for six years. So, yeah, it's exciting. Um, over the last three years, I've grown the business to a team. So instead of just me, um, we had pre-COVID, we were up to four. And now we've been able to sort of, sort of stabilised at three for the team. So, yeah. But it's, um, it's been an amazing journey and we're about to come through the next stage now. So, Yeah, no doubt. And mine was a box of matches. Um, I didn't get to sell the pineapple. Oh, you I, didn't get the pineapple? I, got, I got the box of matches. Um, and yeah, it somehow worked for me as well. Um, and I guess, you know, over the last few months, you know, it's probably been the most challenging time um, that you've probably ever had in those, those 18 years. Um, how's, it, how's it all been going in that? from that side of things and, and what does the front line really look like from, from your point of view? Look, I think that um, it was truly awful. It has been hideous. Um, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, and for me, everything with COVID, I was, when I was talking to colleagues and things were happening, we were probably one of the first to be hit, like where we really started with the cancellation because we had guys travelling to China for work. We had a whole bunch of, you know, Japan bookings for cherry blossoms and things like that. And I had a lot of Italian bookings for March and April. So they were kind of like in the first group to really kind of be the most impacted. So from really from the end of January, we started with the cancellations and, and trying to navigate what was happening with all the rules. And then it just got worse and worse and worse. And that middle weekend for all of us, I don't know, Friday the 13th um, end of March for us was just... Like, literally, the world ended, it felt like, um, where everything that had been snowballing just bang. And, I mean, I don't think I slept that weekend. Like, I and anxiety levels were insane. And I was paranoid. I had people flying in every direction. And I had my phones next to me. And I was, like, 3 a.m. up trying to, like, you know, did you make that connection? Like, have they gotten through that? Is that flight cancelled? Is it going? Like, it was just honest. I've never experienced anything like it. Um, and yes, yeah, so it was really like a really, really traumatic, traumatic period. Um, and 
really made you question like we can't we were being on the back of an absolute record year like we were smashing every record that I've ever done like out of the park you know and the energy and everything that we had and then to suddenly be on the complete opposite of that and be smashing all these instead of smashing records you're smashing these beautiful like itineraries and trips apart and you know it's just it's, it's a, been a grieving process it's been terrible um and it's really only been the last fortnight that i've felt some light and some hope again come through it but i think the biggest thing for us and my husband actually pointed it out to me is that this job that we all love and that we do is built on hope and joy and dreams and excitement and you know you're painting these incredible pictures of 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 what someone can enjoy and, and experience somewhere and you and you've got your own anticipation of your own journey that you're looking forward to and and all your own holiday plans and and when someone you know send posts an instagram photo one of your clients of the view from their window and you're like i made that happen like it is so much it's such a joyous job and all the joy got sucked out of it like you know and replaced by doom and gloom and abuse and you know like moving goalposts faster than we could keep up with and you know like confusion and 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 a heartbreak for the clients as well like all of, of, of the grief that they were going through that they couldn't have these journeys that some of them had been planning for two years or you know like so and all the unknown attached to that so yeah it's been an incredibly difficult time um but i i feel like the the glimmer of hope it's it's there i can i can see it um probably as i said only in the last two weeks that I've really started to feel like, okay, we're going to come through this. And I can see that it's not going to look the same. There's no way it's going to look the same, but you know, the, the, the fire is there, the, the light is there and the hope. And I'm not, you know, I've moved from my cancellations and refunds full-time job to, you know, still doing cancellations and refunds, but also, you know, booking three nights at the Gold Coast or, you know, like planning an itinerary for WA and things like that. So yeah, there's hope now thank goodness <laughs> yeah and i think maybe you know for some people it may take some time before you can actually really reflect on that period of time and really understand how how awful and how bad it actually was you know because people are spending so much time in it um yep. you know and as we do come out into into a little bit of light and as the borders open up you know maybe you, that that'll be a, another another time for for people to to, to have to go through that same process almost again, you know, and actually, you know, relive it in a way where they actually have to address how bad it really was, you know, and, and maybe another, another emotional roller coaster time could, could come, you know, with the light coming up and, and then maybe, I, I don't know, for, for me, I, I guess I'm watching, watching a lot of this from the outside looking in and, and it's great to hear, well, not great, but it's, it's, you know, it's about to hear your story and how things are going. You know, or how things were going and, and how honest you are about it. I think, yeah, for, for all of us, whether you're in it or, or, or watching it, um, I think it will take some time before we really realise how bad um, that situation was. Yeah. What about, uh, what about some, some good stuff? What about some, some wins? Surely um, an agent as, as good as yourself, um, you know, you, you must have pulled off some miracles or, you know, did some, did some, you know, weird and wonderful 3 a.m. saviors of, of some sort to, to somebody who got them home in time or, or, or you did something for a customer that they just no way could have absolutely done themselves. I had, um, I had, I had two that really kind of stuck with me. So one was um, friends who are clients as well. Um, I had gone to visit their um, son and um, granddaughter and daughter-in-law in Singapore. And I didn't know, but it was simple booking. They booked it themselves on Qantas. Anyway, they rang me um, and said, it was like, I don't know, like the 24th of March or something. So it was when everything was, Qantas was starting to pull their flights. But I didn't even know that they were overseas. And they rang me and said, Sonia, we're at Singapore airport and um, there's no flight. We have no flight. It's gone. And I was like, oh. You're in Singapore? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay, hang on. Well, and I looked in the, the Qantas code share with Emirates for that night. That was gone as well. And I'm like, uh, we need to get you home. Okay. Um, all right. So Singapore Airlines has got a flight in oh, 55 minutes. Let's go. 
28 minutes from when they rang me, they were standing at the gate boarding. 28 minutes. I'm like, that is a world record. Like they were bolting from one terminal to the other. I'm ticketing like a mad woman. Um, and I'm, and they, they said there was no one at security. They literally ran through, chucked their bags at check-in, <laughs> bolted through, through security. They're like, this is the way to travel. And I'm like, this is not the way to travel. You do not ring me with 55 minutes to make, for me to get you on a plane. Be at 28 minutes. And I'm like, I don't know if that's an official world record, but I'm, you know, I was quite proud of that one. Um, and they were so grateful. And so, you know, and they sent me a beautiful hamper to thank me afterwards. Like it was quite, you know, that was really heartwarming. And it was little things like that where someone would, you know, send a card or send you flowers or just even write an email or text me a little hug emoji or something, clients, friends, colleagues, you know, just to check in. That that was probably one of the best things to come out of it. And the other one that I had was um, much, not 28 minutes, it went for nearly a month, um, where I had clients who were on the Azamara Pursuit, which I don't know if you know much about what happened with that shit, but um, they basically, they started when the borders were all open, they got a week into their cruise. They were doing a big South American going from um, Buenos Aires up to Lima. So they're going all the way around South America. They got to Chile and Chile went, we're shut. No one's coming in. And then Argentina shut. And then, you know, like it was just, everyone started shutting around them. And so they, the ship sat, sat off the port of Valparaiso for four days while they were trying to negotiate with the Chilean government. So I'm booking, rebooking flights, like trying to do everything that I could. I had, you couldn't get any information about actually where the ship was and what was going on. So I found ship like the marine tracker. So it was like I had GPS tagged as a matter of pursuit and was watching it go up and down the coast and work it out. I was on the phone to DFAT. I had the client's daughter calling me. Um, I, and so literally once we found out what the plan was going to be and that they were going to Miami because the ship was allowed to return to its home port. So even though every other port was shut, the ship could go back to Miami. So I also had friends in Miami and New York and I was getting them onto port authorities and what could we do and how could we route them to come out and then the Australian border was closing and it was just mental. And literally I've tracked this shit all the way up through the Panama Canal, calling everyone, like trying to make sure that they were smooth, smooth sailing texting, WhatsApping the client with like the, you know, two minutes a day that they got on internet because everyone was trying to, you know, connect and so forth. And when we finally, they got into Miami, they got told they were going to clear, they could get through. Then I was watching their flight got cancelled from Miami to New York. So I'm quickly rebooking that, get them through. They're messaging me from JFK and I'm like, oh, thank God, we're part of the way. Got them to Doha, then got them on the Doha Brisbane flight and got them home. And they text me, they were meant to go into mandatory quarantine. They text me and said, we're in a taxi on our way home. And I'm like, what? And because he was elderly, he's 80, they were like, it was higher risk to put him into um, a hotel than to send him home. So he got to go home and sleep in his own bed that night. I was crying. I was beside myself, like literally a month of moving these passengers through. It was like, you know, from the beginning of March and they got home on the 2nd of April. And it was honestly like I felt such relief and such joy. And they were my last clients to come home. But, you know, I learned so many skills and things during that process that, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that I had. But just the logistical nightmare, I was like, God, that's one couple. Like, that's one booking I'm trying to move. Imagine if you had people, you know, like on that scale going everywhere. It was just, yeah, it was incredible. But I felt I was kind of, I was a bit proud of myself, but more, more over relief that they were home, that they were safe and that everything, but you had to be onto it, right? Like you couldn't. You know, things were changing and pulling so quickly that you just had to be able to be watching it and be onto it and react. And we couldn't book the flight out of Miami until we knew they cleared the Panama Canal. They were in a queue to get through the... Like, it was just... It was insane. But, yeah, it was, yeah, such relief for them to be home. Matt, I've, I've literally got goosebumps. You probably yeah. can't see them. But uh, that's that's an incredible story. And mm. and, uh, and no doubt there's, there's hundreds and thousands of those stories out there. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and that was... It was like, everyone's doing this. Everyone's yeah. Doing on some other scale, you know, and it doesn't matter whether you've got a, a, a you know, 10,000 passengers that you're moving or 10 passengers that you're moving, every single person was affected mm. and it was stressful. And yeah, that's what I said. It was just, you know, like you, you had to think so creatively and so differently about this was not our normal job. You know, mm. we were, 
jumping through hoops and making phone calls and contacting and being so resourceful through that period of time that even though it's hideous, if you can reflect on it and try and draw on some of those skills and some of those, well, how did I respond? How did I get through that? How did I cope? I think it's going to make us really resilient moving forward, you know, and to, and hopefully we've, we've all grown and, and can, well, even if now we're still struggling with it, but in, you know, as you said, given time, can look back and reflect and think, yeah, man, I did that. That's amazing. And, and learn from that and, and, and yeah, really take all those skills and things that we, that we acquired through that time and coping mechanisms to, to move forward with whatever our journey is going to look like post COVID. So. Mm. And it'd be so great to, if, you know, if the mainstream out there could, could really hear, you know, some of these stories and, and some of these, you know, miracles that agents pulled off as, as opposed to the, you know the the negative you know stuff that we we're hearing and and the, the stuff that happens on on those certain news programs that happen at about seven o'clock at night that we yeah. we try to avoid watching but we we know that there are plenty of people out there watching and it's just disappointing that that that's what they hear compared to what it is you know that actually went on you know and is still going on through through this period. And I, th- I think for me that's one of the biggest frustrations that I've had out of out of you know out of what's happened is that we've, I, feel, I really feel that we've had no voice for our industry. No one has really spoken for us. And, you know, I'm a, I've been lobbying politicians. We've had letters going left, right and centre, small biz, going to small business, it's like really just trying to, for people to think about where we sit as travel, as travel advisors, like what we're going through day to day. Because the, the, the very small part of the story that's being communicated is not reflective of what 95% of us are doing and, and what our day consists of. And, you know, I, I think it, it's been really disappointing for me that when I thought that, you know, because it's such a beloved industry, you know, we're all so passionate about this industry and then to feel like we've just been forgotten, honestly, like, or made a scapegoat, you know, for a bad news story here or there. And I, that's the one thing that I wish that, you know, we could have that voice. We could have someone stand up for us in a public forum. Um, and I'm too scared. Like people go, oh, you should talk or, you know, you should say something. And that was why I wrote that supermarket um, article. I think you shared it um, yeah. on your page about trying to talk about, you know, if we, if a travel agent were a supermarket and why, um, you know, we have nothing to sell. We need our customers to, to come to us and to buy things as soon as they're on the shelves, whether it's something they would normally have bought or not. But to try and get out to the media that, look, you know, we, we're not sitting here being narky about not giving people's money back. We don't have the money. In fact, we have nothing, you know. So, yeah, but... It's it's just too confronting to try and do it in a public forum because you're just worried that your words are going to get completely twisted or your message is going to get so skewed because you've seen what's happened, um, you know, in some of those you know some of those TV shows and things. And I just I would hate to do more damage, you know, to an already fragile industry. So, yeah. yeah, and that, that's the thing. You know, if you speak out or you know we see some of those interviews that have been done, you know, there's always it always cuts to a, a rebuttal. It always cuts to some some expert, somebody that you know, or some disgruntled customer, or it always just cuts away from it. So it just removes that message. Yeah. You know, I'd love to hear your story, um, and love to hear all of those challenges that are going on, and then I'd love to cut to your eighty-year-old customer who got to sleep in his own bed after that massive ordeal that they went through. Mm-hmm. You know, and that 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 would just then back up. You know what it is that you you know you and and, and the rest of the the frontline agents and everybody out there and, and what they're doing and the suppliers and everybody that's involved you know there's so many so many hands touching so much of this stuff um and and yeah look it's kind of the reason why this group started you know is is you know i, I personally could see everything that was happening around me and, and how devastating it was um so it's good that we're you know we're coming together and and, and as a collective and as an industry, we're all fully aware of what we've all been through and, and what you guys are doing out there on the front line and, and what everyone is doing behind the scenes to make this happen. But nobody else is really getting to know that, you know, no one, no, no one's, as you said, there's no voice for us. There's no, there's no one really, you know, screaming that from the, from the rooftops. And, you know, that is, that is disappointing and challenging at the same time. But, you know, I guess something that we can't really control too much on and we just need to continue to keep doing what you guys are doing every day, you know, looking after those customers, as you said, being really, really customer focused, really, really focusing on what's in front of you and, and you know, the, the good will come out of it. You know, the karma will come back. You know, we, we know, we, we just, we know. Um, we just need to 
as easy as it is to say, but you know, hang in there, you know, keep moving forward. You know, if you, if you can, you know, continue on doing what you're doing, the light is starting to pop open a little bit. Um, there is a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. What I, what I'd like to get from your opinion, because obviously you've been in the game for, for quite some time, but you know, the, what are the couple of key things that you think that were the most sort of frustrating parts of the whole ordeal and, and possibly even things that, that didn't need to be as frustrating as, as they were or didn't need to be as challenging or didn't need to be as hard. There's just kind of, you know, red tape or bureaucracy or, or, or terms and conditions or policies that are kind of archaic that have been there forever. And what would you have just gone, you know what, if that just wasn't there or, you know, if, that, if, we, if we didn't have to do it that way, life would be so much simpler or so much easier. What are, what are the, some of the, the things that have come out of that that process that you've kind of thought of gone, you know, we really could fix this stuff. I think, um, I think that, you know, so the, the bugbear for everyone has been around the airline policies, to be honest. And that, you know, at least the cruise industry, even though there's been differences between, you know, sort of what one cruise line will do or another will do on the whole, they've kind of moved, you know, as a collective in terms of when they're setting their dates and when their boundaries have been and offering future cruise credits and, you know, extra percentages and things like that for people in lieu of refunds. But the airlines, it's just been a schmozzle. And, you know, like it's the constantly changing boundaries, the inconsistency. One airline will give you a full refund. One won't give you, you know, will give you a credit that's valid until the 15th of August, for example. Like, you know, it's like, the, it's some of them, and you feel like you've done the wrong thing by your customer by getting them to book on a certain airline because, you know, they're, they're really getting shafted essentially with what they're entitled to in terms of refunds, credits, flexibility, and so forth. You know, whereas you had other airlines that came out, like Emirates, for example, that just said, we're giving you two years. You're, we've thrown every, you know, ticket validity rule out the window. If you really need a refund, you can get a refund. But otherwise, we encourage you, park your ticket, two years, we'll use it anywhere, we'll do whatever we need to do with it. And I think if that approach, obviously early on it was very difficult. But when it became very clear that the whole world was shutting down and no one was going anywhere for a very long time, particularly for ex-Australia, then I think more blanket rules and more, you know what, I know our system doesn't allow us to have more than 12 months validity from the day of ticketing, but we're just going to turn that button off. Let's turn it off. And let's say, you know, or, oh, this one you've got to apply for an EDM. This one you can just hold an active PNR. This one you just need the ticket number. Like, just have a system. That's all it needed to be. And IATA or whoever needed to come in and just streamline that process. And they still could. It's still not too late for something like that to happen to make it easier moving forward, you know. But these constantly... I mean, I was doing Qantas updates every five minutes, it felt like. Like, I'd watch the webinar, get to the end of the policy, and then it'd be like, oh, you've changed it again. Oh, now it's a different authority number. Oh, now that credit can be split into multiple credits. But I've just told my client I couldn't. Like, it's... it. it I mean, that was that was the worst thing. And, and now also, though, exactly, absolute mind blow. But I think now moving forward, the risk we're in are these ones where we've been told we could get a refund early on, we've put them in for refund and now the refunds are getting denied or the refunds are getting stopped. Or because we didn't tick a box the certain way when we submitted the refund, then it's been rejected, it goes back to the bottom of the pile. Like That's frustrating when you've told a client, yes, you can have this. And then between when you've hit submit and the airline gets to it, the rules have changed. And now you've got to go back to your customer who is already annoyed and say, look, I'm really sorry, but I know I told you two months, it's now five months, and I know I told you to get a refund on that, but now you can't. That's that's the hardest thing, because it, it really shoots down our credibility as well. And all we're trying to do is navigate this minefield. So I think clarity and streamline, there's no reason why it, things couldn't have been clearer and still can't move to that, you know, sort of clearer process moving forward. But I can't change it. I would love to. <laughs> if you know anyone that can change <laughs> it, let's get on to it. But yeah, that's so that for me, that's been probably the biggest frustration. Um, yeah. And look, the border thing for us here in Queensland um, has definitely put doubt in my clients' minds. We're talking, I'm talking about state borders. And, you know, like, it's not even that. We understand things are flexible and we understand, like I'm saying to my clients, you can book it. And if we have to, you know, there's, 
the deposits refundable or, you know, we can defer it or we can go, but some of them have got money sitting here and credit there and refund waiting here. And they don't necessarily want to be outlaying more money when there's uncertainty. They don't necessarily want to go, well, I know logically November should be okay for me to book a trip to Tasmania, but I don't really want to spend 30% deposit on this and, and, you know, have this money sitting out there to then find I can't go to then have to try and get more refunds or more credits and things back. So, so I get that they're uncertain, but I think that if we could have had more clarity around, look, you know, I know we've said the 10th of July for Queensland, but really it's going to be September, but we don't really know. Like that's, that's where clients have gone too hard. I'm waiting. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not even going to think about it until I know what I can do. So that's, that's from a selling point of view, from trying to move into the recovery phase, that's definitely been the hardest thing. Um, so it's all going to come down to confidence. You know, it's all going yeah. to come down to consumer confidence, agent confidence. Everyone needs, needs, needs their confidence back because yeah. it's been hit so hard. Um, to, you know, customers want their confidence. I don't know, for me, as you said, like um, advisor confidence is down as well because I'm scared to book stuff. Like, you know, clients that might say, oh, well, I want to book that flight to there. I'm like, no, we're not booking flights now. I'm not booking flight yet because it's September and God knows what's going to happen to that schedule between now and September. And I know you've got, you know, so I'm saying use some points. Why don't you use some points? Because points are flexible. Points come back into your account straight away and your taxes get put back onto your, re onto your credit card within three to five days. Use your points to book that flight because I'm too scared to do it at the moment, which is terrible. Like, mm. you no, know, like I ticket two million bucks of airfares a year and I'm too scared to book a flight. Like that's because I just don't want my customers to get caught any more than they already are. So, yeah, I think that's the, it, it, that's all the unknown. But, you know, we're going to have to find a way to navigate that as best as we can move forward because, it's not going away. It's just going to have to be how we can adapt and how we, and all our processes have to be reevaluated. You know, with, with the, you know, folding of ACS and us not having, you know, sort of any protection for us outside of flights and land for, um, you know, for chargebacks and for insolvency. Like, you know, we have to think about how we can protect our bottom line moving forward, how we can protect the funds from our client. You know, we can't just, you know, take a direct deposit and pay on eNet or payment gate anymore. Like, you know, we have to think about, well, how do I protect my client? And so everything has to change the way that we look moving forward. So there's so much uncertainty around everything. And I think, again, this comes down to, you know, after really starting to step up and give us stronger guidelines, not just loose recommendations around things, but being, this is best practice what you need to be doing and, and there is a little bit of that starting to come through but I think it, it a lot of it gets lost up in sort of like you know like agency management level and it doesn't necessarily filter down particularly to us as like independent contractors or you know home-based people or um, you know people who are who might be say stood down at the moment and are going to step back into that business a lot is going to have changed from when they got stood down in March until they start again in September like it's 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 a different world so you know and you can't do your job the same way that you used to so there's there's got to be this period now where we're really starting to address what is it going to look like for us to transact and for us to look after our clients and moving forward suppliers have got to come on board and think well hang on if if, if an agent wants to pay by a secure payment method which is perhaps on agency credit card or consumer credit card direct how are we going to and we've never done that before, we've only ever taken direct deposit or email or payment gate or whatever, how are we going to navigate that? So there's got to be a lot of thinking and forward planning. There's got to be a lot of education of, you know, consultants, of agency owners, of suppliers, of, of BDMs. Like there's talking about what it's going to look like moving forward because we can't, can't do business the way that we did, I did in February. It's just not going to exist. Mm -hmm. So... And on top of that, it's also, like, for me, um, you know, trying to think about, well, what am I going to sell? Like, what am I going to... Like, I'm 90% of what I did was outbound, luxury, FIT, high-end cruising, and an older demographic, 70-plus. So these people are too scared to go anywhere. That's the reality of it. Like, you know, not all of them, but I have the most intrepid travellers, people who should have been in Georgia and Armenia at the moment, who will not leave their home for an overnight stay. Now... That is how scared they are about it. So I can't expect to recoup. I'm not going to be able to book a $50,000 holiday for them in Australia. It's not going to happen. 
you know, they're not going to rebook to use their credits to travel next year until they know there's more certainty, there's a vaccination, there's, you know, clarity around, you know, where we can go and what we can do. And that's going to be safe for them to do so. You know, so every, everything's shaken up. Like you can't, yeah. They, they talked about, you know, hibernation and, and people just kind of like, you know, put your business in hibernation. Well, that's all well and good if you do. But if you come out of this like a sleepy bear at the end of it, you are stuffed. You have to come out having metamorphosized, having become something different, having learnt more, doing things like, you know, watching all these great advisors that you've had on talking, you know, following things like the Travel Hub, like watching and educating yourself in, in, in all different forms of and challenging your ideas on how you can do business, how you can look after your clients, what product you can sell, what other suppliers you can work with. You know, so yeah, there's there's just so much there, and and it's about finding a way through that noise to 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 drive your you know what you want your future to look like in this industry moving forward. And on that, then Sonia, what what have you you know gained from all of that um, you know extra stuff that you've been doing in that in that space? What are some of the things that you're you're now thinking about for the future and, and working on for your business? So one of, one of the big things that's really come out of this for me is transparency around fees. That's um, something that I've always charged fees, but a lot of it I've built into whatever I've quoted the airfare or, you know, like if I've put a package together, like I've tailored something for a client and I'll, and I'll you know, build my fee into that. Whereas now all of that has to be stripped back because... And, and that's partially because we've been talking about the C word being commissioned so openly over the last four months um, that, you know, I think if clients understand better how we get paid, then all the arguments over, well, why didn't I get a full refund or why are you trying to say that, you know, the cruise line's going to give me back $20,000, but I paid $22,000. Like, why, you know, why is that? And, and so I think if we can sort of understand and explain to clients more about we are paid a commission and I'm going to retain that commission if you cancel a portion or all of this trip and it's to the value of, say, 10% or 15% or whatever, but be transparent up front. Yes, you know, I charge $150 to book your airfare, you know, but I don't charge to book a hotel or I don't charge. If I'm paid a commission on it, I will not charge you for that. But I think it's all about that transparency and working out either what your agency has set up for fees or your brand has set up for fees or you as an independent, because we're the ones that are too scared to put the fees on a lot of the time, really look at it and think about it and understand our value and our worth and, and be transparent with that with clients, not just, oh, I know I'm worth paying a booking fee to book with. Well, explain to them why, but also have it transparent there from the beginning. So there's no... You know, I didn't know it was going to cost me $75 in addition to whatever Qantas charges to change my ticket. Well, yes, it is. There it is. It's on your, you know, it's on your fee schedule. So I think that's a big thing for me to come out of it as well. The other thing that I've done is I've, I feel like I've done a marketing degree in the last four months, which is... I'm sorry to everyone who has spent four years doing a marketing degree, but, you know, I feel like I've done this intensive course um, because I'm like, I thought I was okay at marketing and I, you know, I had a presence with my clients, but I never had to look for clients because I had more business coming in than I knew what to do with sometimes, you know? Um, and then suddenly I have no business, zero. Um, but also I have a whole product range that I've been selling that now I can't sell. So I've had to find ways to align with, you know, the, all the stuff that my clients love to do globally and find ways to replicate those kind of experiences for them locally. So it might be, um, you know, like I know the style of hotels that they like or I know that they like really immersive, you know, experiences, hands-on, personalised. Well, where can I send them, either in Queensland, for example, or Tasmania or wherever, where can I send them or what can I inspire them with that is perhaps more likely that they're going to book? So there's been, I've spent so much time doing product research, trying to set up um, agreements and relationships with suppliers that I've probably never heard of before, but that have also never needed to, to work with someone like me and collaboratively share all that information with colleagues and with, you know, sort of co-workers and things like that to really try and help strengthen the message that we are here we, to, to leverage off each other and to help each other and to, and to try and get everyone's businesses back up and running however we can. 
So yeah, I've been really working on a really dedicated marketing approach and um, it's really, it's really working, honestly, like, um, you know, the engagements that I'm getting on social media and, and also for me, like to have a strong, clear message that I'm putting out every week rather than just a haphazard kind of, oh crap, it's Tuesday, I haven't posted for two days, what will I put up? So to have a real, and I've never had the time or I've never made the time to, to, to build in a really clear marketing plan into to what I'm doing. So, but the irony is that, you know, it's, I probably should have been doing this all the time. Like it shouldn't be that it's something that I'm doing now, but I think if I can get the platform in place now, it will make moving easier when I can start, you know, talking about Norway again, or I can talk about Japan again or things like that, that I've, I've already got the building blocks and the foundations there and a lot of the content already there, but I can now make it a more structured, formalized, dedicated, focused, approach um, to getting out there to my clients and and hopefully keep that momentum going and I think what I heard in there was that really understanding your customers is key oh, to then to then going through into marketing it's kind of like well you see what the big data mining you know um, online platforms are doing to us by you know putting that little picture of something that you clicked on two days ago back in front of you and like oh maybe I do need those shoes yeah. you know that we don't have the ability to do that you know individually um, like like they do um, so what, what we do have that they don't have is actually personal relationships with our with our clients that we can actually speak to over the phone and say you know tell me about this tell me about that Th let's think about what what's next for you or you know you might just develop an understanding of that client over the years that you've known them anyway but that you know really understanding each, each customer in a personal level will then help you understand how to then market to them and and, and inspire them and, and help them understand what products are available to them based on the relationship that you have with them not not based on how you've mined their data and they're they're clicking on whatever you know online shopping that they've been doing you know it's, it's actual relationship stuff which is great um, and as you said with the time to actually put in place that you know, daily posting or, or, you know, what happens on what day and, and what, what, what products and, and how often, you know, it's really, it's a really important thing. And I think what happens in the travel industry, because we, we know generally over a 12 month period in the travel industry, there are these busy periods and quiet periods. There's, you know, the, when travel expos happen around, whether you're part of them or not part of them, we know that that's a busy time. So everybody gets busy. Um, and then, you know, Easter comes and it gets quiet or, you know, Christmas time comes and it gets a little bit quiet. So we, we know that happens. And usually by the time it gets quiet, we all scramble to try to create some form of like ad hoc marketing thing or ad hoc posting on our social media, try and get some customers in. And we all know that that's too late, you know, travel such a, a long game. So it's kind of like when you're the busiest, that's when you should be setting up for those quiet periods. So really what you're doing now with, with that foundation of, of setting you up so that when, when you do become busy again, it's already in place. Um, and you don't just go, well, I've got heaps of customers. I'm good. You know, um, because really, I, I don't know who's going to sit in that um, yeah. that space moving forward. You know, I'm good. I'm full. I, I, I don't I don't have any more room. Sorry, sorry, we're we're full at the end. Um, you know, so any opportunity to grow your database, grow your portfolio, build your travel community is going to be key moving forward. And I think it's great that someone as experienced and as successful as you are, uh, are showing, you know, that everybody really should be playing in that space um, right now. Um, and, and if they're not, then, and if they're still in this cancellation and refund mode and, and this, this hamster wheel, um, then when it eventually stops and then you try to then, kickstart this massive marketing campaign or whatever it is that you're going to do it, it's going to be too late so you know it's it's, it's good advice but there's uh we've gone through a lot this has been a roller coaster of, of emotions like like i'm sure the last four months have been for you um but you know and, and lots of value in there and i'm sure you know people watching they probably have to pause and go back and dissect some of that stuff but you know i, I think you know you, you'll find there'll be people taking notes and, and hopefully getting some good value which would be great um lighter note what what's what's next for you personally what, what you got a trip booked are you, are you gonna <laughs> head up you're gonna head up the coast uh, are, are you gonna anticipate this border opening that that anna thinks gonna happen in july so I'm that person that the minute I heard that you could drive 250 kilometres, I'm like, where can I get to? I think I got to 247 kilometres on my little Google map. I worked out where I could get to. So um, it's actually my husband and I 20th wedding anniversary this month. And um, 
while we're not in our rock star suite in Hawaii like we were meant to be. And we're going to Spice's Hidden Vale for a couple of nights, which will be gorgeous. Beautiful. Um, and then um, we're going to Stanthorpe, which was the 247 kilometre mark for us with the kids in the school holidays. So just trying to actually enjoy a little bit more of, you know, our local area while we can. And then um, I'm going to Longreach in August, which is, I have never been so excited about a trip. Um, I've been doing this whole push on Outback Queensland and, and having a look at sort of what's out there and so doing a self-fam out there um, to Longreach and Winton for four days and, you know, going to the age of the dinosaurs and Winton and doing a Drivers Creek sunset cruise and staying in a gorgeous brand new glamping tent and, you know, like watching the, you know, amazing night skies from a, you know, bath on a terrace at Saltbush. I'm so excited. Like I've, you know, never been, I'm so pumped. It's like I'm going to Europe for four months, you know, four months is what it feels like. Um, but yeah, look, I'm, I'm always someone that's got to have something to look forward to. And that's what I was saying before about the whole hope and the hope having been extinguished that even just the minute I booked that two nights at Spices, I was like, oh my God, I've got something to look forward to. And it's also really interesting. I think it's really important that we as you know, travel advisors are leading the way with the travel too. Because last week I had a few clients start to ring me and not to book anything, but just, just to have a chat. And two of them said to me, you're our litmus test. So if you travel somewhere, I know I can travel somewhere. If you get on a plane, I know I can get on a plane. You go and stay overnight somewhere, I know I can go and stay. And I was like, oh my God, really? But it's because they trust us that if we deem that it's okay and they see us doing and living, then they're like, well, well Sonia did that. So if it's okay for her to get on a plane and she had a mask and I saw where she sat and how she did check in, okay, all right, I can visualise that now. Maybe I can do that too. So I think there's going to, this is a great opportunity for all of us. And even if it is isn't, you're only driving an hour away, I think even, you know, showing our clients and that and colleagues that might be a bit, you know, sort of, you know, unsure about stepping out there into the, you know, the COVID world, what it's like, what the experience is like, and that there is hope and that we can travel. And it mightn't be that we're going to Maui for our honeymoon or, you know, wedding anniversary or whatever, but we can still have a really special and unique time on a different scale locally and also help support our local tourism as well, which has really taken a massive flogging. And we, we all have to help each other as best as we can. So, yeah, so I'm like, oh, and I'm going to Adelaide in September. So there you go, I've got four trips in four months. I'm so excited. <laughs> Mate, I wish you could see how big my heart was bursting when I, when I heard you saying all that stuff because it's absolutely what we've been preaching on this this yeah. platform as much as possible. Travel agents are the ones that are going to lead the way, you know, and we had a chat to the Agents of Influence guys the other day and, and they're doing some great stuff in the, in the social media space. But, you know, if suppliers are watching or anyone out there and you're thinking, how are we going to get confidence in the consumer to come back and travel on our product? Put a travel agent on your tour, put them on your plane, put them on your ship. They will lead the way and their customers will follow. Yeah. Like I want to shout that to the world because it is the reality. And you're just given that perfect example of what your customers are calling you and saying, you know, should we, should we not, should we, you know, and the day that you fly, and post a photo or do a story on your Instagram or a Facebook story or something that shows what it's like to walk through an airport, what it's like to get on a seat, what it's like to check into a hotel and all of those things that are going to happen. You know, you watch the flow and effect. You watch the, you know, the ripple effect of that happen through through the customers and those the customers' friends and friends and friends and they all see it and that's that's where we'll find this confidence, which we talked about only 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, is, going to, is the most challenging part of it. We, we don't have the confidence to go. Yeah. So when we can go, agents, go. That's the first thing you need to do. If you want your business to survive, you have to go. Like you, there's no sitting around. You have to go. You have to go. Even if you're in the world of pain of cancellations and refunds, you need to go. You need to go somewhere. Um, and you need to promote that to everybody who, who will watch you on, on all of your platforms, EDMs, socials, whatever. You need to go. And, and that's what I was say. It doesn't even mean that, you know, you don't have to be an agent of influence. You don't have to be someone with a really strong social media presence because I found actually my best marketing strategy is a personal email to a client telling them about something or saying, I saw this the other day, I think you would love this. So if you know that you've got people who are unsure, 
And it might be, say, 10 clients even. And you email them and say, you know what, I've just went and stayed here for the weekend. It was amazing. I was really worried. And, and be honest and say, look, I was worried. I didn't know what check-in was going to be like or I didn't know how this process was going to go. I didn't know, you know, I was. I love going there for the, for the dining, but I didn't know if the restaurant was going to be, what the atmosphere was going to be like. But can I tell you, it was amazing. And here's a photo and blah, blah, blah. That is as powerful and actually probably has a much stronger, you know, opportunity of making a real impact to those 10 clients that you've emailed that to than whether you have 10,000 followers on Instagram. Yeah. So, you know, don't be afraid. I think some people are like, I don't have, you know, particularly if they work for someone else, I don't have a strong, you know, social media presence where I don't have a Facebook page, whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, however you can connect with your clients and market to your clients, you need to be doing that. So, you know, and as I said, whether, as you said, whether it's an EDM, whether it's an email, whether it's a phone call, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's writing them a little, like printing a little postcard of, of somewhere that you know that they would love to go and writing a little message on it and throwing it in the post. Like little things like that, that will all make a difference. But you have to stay connected, you have to market and you have to lead from the front, hands down, if you want to survive in this industry moving forward. And, the, and you're, you're so familiar to long reach. I mean, that's just, you know, not everybody can do it. Everybody's got their own situation or whatever, but, you know, you know, I still, to, to this day, I still, I, I, you know, I hope he's watching, but, you know, Greg Ashmore, um, you know, he's, he's an icon, you know, of the, of the industry absolutely. And, and, and absolutely led from the front. But, you know, the, the second that I, 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 I you know, went, went, to, went to Ashmore and, and to their business and found out what they were doing, and, you know, the, the one thing that, that always stuck with me is if you want to sell the fucking plaza, stay at the fucking plaza. 100%. And, yeah. and that's it, you know. You, you need to experience it. You need to go and see it. You need, you need to go and leave from the front. So if you are going to start dabbling in, in domestic and, and outback, you know, luxury or whatever, which is perfect for your business, then you know, go and do it. One, you'll have a great time. Yeah. And the return on investment will come back to you in, in, in folds. Um, so we, we know that. So, you know, not everybody has the client base that's going to go and necessarily do a luxurious, you know, trip to, to Longreach, but you've got a database or a community of some sort that are going to do something. So have a think about what they might want to do and then maybe you can get in front of that and be proactive and maybe go and experience it yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's great. I, you know, I, I believe in a lot of the stuff that you've, you've got to say, uh, Sonia, it's, it's, it's really refreshing to know that that, that is, that is out there and, and, you know, it's, Hopefully, hopefully we can all start to, to as I said, look at that light. <laughs> yeah, come through hibernation. The, the, little, the little cave has opened. The, you know, the bear's woken up a little bit, um, you know, from this, this, this cancellation refund nightmare and everything that everyone's been through over the last few months. And, and if we can just start moving forward, um, start dabbling, start being the inspiration for your customers, um, be brave enough to go and experience it. And, and be, as you said, be open and honest about your own personal feelings. Be transparent. I, I did feel this way, but I went and did it and it's, it is okay. Um, and then, you know, the, the customers will be able to do the same. And we all, we all need the confidence. So whatever we can all do collectively to create that um, is, is the key. And, and, yeah, the terms and conditions stuff and the, and the airlines and all those bits and pieces, I, I really hope that we can all, you know, come out the other side with a, a real much simpler way of, of navigating the way through all of this. Um, but even before we get to, to, to fixing all of those problems, just moving forward is, is the key. You know, let's, let's just go and do something. I'm, I'm going whale watching on Saturday down the oh. coast. Just take him, take him a boy. Well, um, my daughter had massive uh, seasickness when, we, when I took her to Cairns and took her out on the reef. So she's like, she's off boats forever. So that'll be, that'll be a challenge. But he's like, yeah, let's do it. You know, so we're down the coast. We're, we're going to go and hopefully see some whales. And, and just moving, just, just move forward, do something. And, you know, and let's, let's see the ripple effect hopefully follow. So... Maybe before I let you go, uh, is there anyone else out there that you know um, that would jump on, share their story, add some value to the group as much as you have today? Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I would love to nominate Tracy Ann O'Sullivan, who is another um, home-based um, independent agent like I am. Um, she's been around forever, worn lots of different hats, um, but most recently has been doing um, small group, takes a lot of small group tours to India, Japan, South Africa. And she is one of the best pivoters, if we want to hate that word, but, you know, she has really pivoted in this, um, in this climate. And instead of having a group go to Japan, she was the first one to put an Outback tour together. Like, she just jumped straight onto it, right, let's go, you know, went and found operators, went and, you know, sort of forged relationships with people and, you know, 
bang, straight away, September, off they go, this small group tour. So um, I think she would add a lot of, um, a lot of interest and colour and a different perspective to what, um, what I have. But, yeah, she's really well respected and she'll be a lot of fun to have on. So, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yay, you. <laughs> but, uh, look, thank you. Uh, this has been great. Um, I hope that as many agents as possible can jump on and, and everybody um, in the group jumps on and, and has a watch of this one because I think there's a huge amount of value to be had. Um, you know, yeah. you've been very honest with, with how you've gone over the last few months. You've got some great ideas and, and it sounds like you've been working just as hard on, on what the other side is going to look like, um, you know, which, which is fantastic. And I know you, you no doubt like the rest of us have had shitty, shitty dark days um, where you probably didn't want to go to bed and, and you didn't want to do all of the stuff that you've been doing. Um, but as we talk about, you know, if, if more days can be moving forward and proactive than, than not, then, you know, we're, we're at least going in the right direction. So, uh, again, massive thank you, mate. And, and I look forward to catching up on the other side and, and seeing how everything sort of pans out for you um, over the next few months. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. No worries, mate. Talk soon. See ya. See ya.